we're getting there and you can hear shots are still being fired. You can hear the officers and the angst in their voice. You're like, man, we need to go solve this. And you don't know exactly how many people are in there. Nobody knew at the time it was just him. And I know I was the first one there with a zoo gun that actually deployed and I came up with it. And one of the sergeants there says, are you good to go with that? I said, I can do this, what we need to do. And so they're like, if he starts shooting out those ports again, what do you want to do? I said, well, we can just start at the front and just work our way to the bottom third of it. I'll just start putting rounds through the bottom of that thing. We'll see how armored it is. I said, we can make it. We can make some good shots here. And I had gone up there and, and getting ready to charge it. And about the time, Jude Braun, the only time in his whole career he's actually been early to anything, shows up with the 50 cals in the APCs, and they go, okay, we're going to deploy these. He had actually called 911 and said what he had done in order to get in touch with SWAT. So one of the negotiators is at the command post, and he basically says, I have bombs at headquarters, I have bombs in the van, come get me. Out of all the major cities that had the rioting, Dallas was the only one that did not have a loss of life. And I will say that I looked at it, what everyone else was doing in the cities on how the response to us, and Dallas did it differently. I won't say what it is, but there was something I think we all kind of agreed on and the approach we were going to take with these crowds, and that kept our officers safe, and it kept us from being put in positions where we had to take lethal force on some of these people. You're listening to the ATO Bridging the Divide podcast. Brought to you by the Assist the Officer Foundation. Since 1999, the ATO has given assistance to the first responder community. And now we want to give them a platform to hear their incredible stories. We also want to hear the stories of the many people that support us. Our community is small, but it is strong. We have differences. We don't always agree. And we all make mistakes. But together we can grow we can heal and we can learn from those mistakes and together we can bridge the divide welcome back ATO listeners we're going to continue with part two of the history and evolution of Dallas SWAT we're back with the commander Matt Smith Steve Claggett and Danny Canetti we're still missing Josh and Misty, Michelle, hope you're going to listen and wish you were here. We've talked about a lot of critical incidents leading up to uh, this part two, Electric Boogaloo, Danny. Um, We're going to go into an event that happened in January of 93, and it's an anatomy of disaster when it comes to planning and execution and our department, our city, learned from that for the next year. And it's the Dallas Cowboy Victory Parade. The town was going ape shit crazy. We hadn't had a had a champion here since uh, Roger Stahlback and Danny White couldn't push us over the hump. We got Troy Aikman, we got the triplets, and we won a championship. And we wanted to have a parade. And the city and a lot of other leaders decided they wanted to have it a certain way. And there was a lot of safety that was disregarded and we had a disaster our city just does not do well with the parades here to talk about that is going to be the commander and claggett can y'all talk about that yes I, I, go ahead no go no ahead. you you open it up with the planning okay. aspect of it yeah the the, the planning aspect of it uh, there was none Basically, the the rumor was that it was basically written up on a napkin over lunch and then uh, uh, implemented from there. There was a lot of uh, input from, I think, local politicians on what needed to happen. I know probably the biggest surprise from our standpoint is when uh, we get there to the parade, they're kind of explaining what we're going to be doing, a little quick hot wash on what we're supposed to be doing on this, and, and uh, found out that everybody's going to be sitting in convertible cor- Corvettes, ground level basically, the uh, no stanchions, no barricades, but Hooters girls were going to be there to keep the crowd under control. So yeah. that was that, that sounds like a bad idea. Well, no, but they didn't have any wings with them. So had no. they had beer and wings, it would have kept the crowd more mellow. Yeah. But, um, turning on to Commerce Street. Yeah. 
turning onto Commerce Street and seeing the mass of people there took everybody by surprise. We're going to post a picture of that of that. Yes. Of the I've got, I've got surrounded. Yep. two pictures there, one of this original parade and one of the second parade. Yeah, uh, we're going to do a side-by-side. Impressive, side. impressive vision. Yep. And in and, and, and true departmental fashion, we presumed we're going to have compliance, that everybody's just going to be there and have a good time and there'd be nothing going wrong. Um, just to help exacerbate the problem, um, DSD decided they were going to bring in busloads of kids. They're going to they're going to give them an excuse off. day. Yep, call school off. Bring in busloads of kids. Have no plan to bus them back. So that was that was pretty much contributed to the issues. But I think everybody had the same reaction when we came around that corner. It was just your mouth hung open, and everybody just looked at each other and go, "Here we go." Um, and of course, you learn how to you learn how to fight early for your buddies. The guy standing to your right and standing to your left. Um, I didn't realize how valuable that was and how valuable horses were. Oh, because uh, the horses did some unique stuff. But it was it was chaos. And you know, we deal with chaos a lot, especially in crowd control stuff. And that we bring force to to respond to chaos. So basically, I don't want to say violence to 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 neuter violence but that was kind of the whole thing on that is it, it was a five block fist fight and it was not moving fast my uh, my squad was assigned a trophy truck which was the lead vehicle in the parade and we got up to commerce and harwood and we were supposed to turn south on harwood and go over to canton and down to city hall and i remember getting up there at that intersection and i turned and looked back down behind me and it was nothing you could not you could not discern that there was a parade. It was just a massive sea of humanity. We got to City Hall, and some of the some of the other lead elements to the parade were arriving. I remember seeing Harold Lewis. Harold Lewis, a great big guy, great big guy, and he was wasted. He was wore out. And I, having seen already what we what I had seen and heard the radio traffic with the the chief, Chief Bill Rappin was in Atlanta, Georgia at the time, interviewing for the Atlanta Olympics. So the SWAT, the special operations chief, we've mentioned his name before, Stallion. He and 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 our captain wanted to be a, wanted to be part of this celebration, so they wanted to be in with the Troy Aikmans and the Stars. They're out of the picture. They're OBE, and they can't communicate. They are fighting for their ass. I mean, literally. And I turned to John Hancock, and I said, Lieutenant, we better call the patrol response team now because we're fixing to lose this one big time. And, and indeed, we almost did. What, can you describe how, what happened with the planning, and, and what, what was the failure? The failure, if, you, if it boils down, the failure occurred in allowing non-trained, non-experienced, non-law enforcement people to dictate security for such event. You, they have no perception, no, no idea of what they're talking about, and for them to draw up tactical plans for an operation like this is a flaw in and of itself. Uh, that, that and that's where it all began, right there. Uh, as you will see in the second parade in the video, the, the photos that was taken out of their hands and put in the hands of of competent, uh, uh, seasoned law enforcement people to design a secure package is what I call it, and you see the picture. Yeah. But uh, that's that's the difference between the planning stage, uh, idiots excuse me, civilians versus law enforcement professionals planning such an event. So no plan, you say, going into this. So what was SWAT doing at the time? And at some point, was there a play or a plan made in the midst of all this? To my knowledge, there was no plan B. And and all of your SWAT, all of Dallas SWAT, was dispersed throughout the the multiple vehicles that were that constituted the parade itself every package was supposed to have one or two players in the vehicle a SWAT guy on each side and mounted between the cars all right so when this all went to ship basically you just had to stand fast with your protectees essentially basically yeah Yeah. they in fact what what became i don't want to say humorous 
But the mob mentality was interesting to watch on this because first thing they would do, they they want to touch the players. Then they start borrowing things off the players like jewelry and things like that. And then it became stuff that the cops were wearing, like because we we're class A's again, Rip, ripping your badge yeah, off. That was a trophy. Stealing like your that. weapon, your your hat. Yeah, your, Emmett, Emmett Smith had a necklace appropriated. Yes, I think I heard. And I was in the vehicle with Kenny Gant. He had a necklace stolen, and I can't remember who was in the car with him. He ended up just grabbing grabbing a girl out of the crowd, which I thought was was great because she was getting mobbed, little girl, and he pulled her into the car. Kenny did? No, nope. the, the guy that was in his car. I didn't I didn't okay. recognize the guy, but he pulled this little girl in the car and, and protected her. I thought that was genius. Of course, some wow. states they call that kidnapping, but yeah, well, uh, no, but it, it was it was uh, it was an exercise in futility, and it just it it would amaze me to watch how the crowd just changed and became by start smashing windows, um, you know, especially after the the it, the parade was by we had to go back in and now they're like okay we're done with the parade so now we got to ha- go secure buildings at liquor stores stores that were having windows smashed and looted we got radio traffic as as most of the elements of the parade got to city hall after fighting i mean literally fighting every step of the way up to harwood and back to city hall we got word through the dispatcher that the mcdonald's at commerce yeah. and griffin it, the crowd was erupting. They were tearing up buses. They were gang banging people. They were doing. It was just going to hell. And and as tactical as SWAT officers got to the got to the city hall, they broke away from that and and responded to Commerce and, and Griffin for crowd control. And w- and we established that block there next to McDonald's between Jackson and Commerce at our CP. An assembly point, and from there we we began initiating crowd control techniques. Some of us have been around long enough that they still remembered the old crowd control stuff from way way back when. Splitting the crowd, the horses were marvelous. The horses were marvelous. So, how long did this take for this parade route? Uh, not distance wise, but time wise. How long are you in this? Um, we assembled that morning around ten o'clock. At Reunion Arena, where the, where the parade was put together and launched. And uh, it was close to dark. By the time we got the crowd dispersed to the point where we could start to stand down. The parade itself oh. was an hour and a half. Just, just to get from, from the beginning of it there by the McDonald's back to City Hall was an hour, about an hour and a half. And it was the majority of it was just moving inch by inch. Like I'm going, walking through a mosh pit. To yeah, get, yeah, and yeah. Driving oh, you it. weren't walking. Yeah. It, it was. The, there was in one incident again. I'm going to talk about Richard Garcia, the most unlucky guy on the face of the earth. At one point in time, he is trapped underneath one of the cars, one of the Corvettes. His leg is pinned with a tire or by the tires. Um, there's confetti everywhere, so confettis and catalytic converters don't mesh well. No. So now the car starts on fire, and one of the horses ends up on the hood of this car. So it, it's it's just like you couldn't write it better you, than you, that. You could you you can't imagine creating a story no. like that. You you said that the that the mounted they shine that day. Can you oh. explain what they did and, and why they stood out? When we when we got everybody when we started to assemble all of the Dallas SWAT and response teams at at uh, Griffin and Commerce. Uh, we started making headway to split the crowd, driving a portion of the crowd west on Commerce, another portion of it north on Griffin, and another portion of it east on Commerce. The east on Commerce was driving everybody into the parade calamity. The, the thing that I think turned it around is we showed no mercy. We would identify the agitators, those who were leaders in the crowd and agitating the crowd, and the horses would go in and extract. get them, extract them, mm-hmm. literally. And we made it an obvious sign that others didn't want to be caught in that position. And the people we arrested, we held in that block where the command post was set up between Jackson and Commerce, their own Griffin, and the others just kind of fell by the, the wayside of the... the um, <laughs> the, the melee can, the yeah. melee because <laughs> it, it was wholesale they yeah. got equine therapy 
Yeah, that. That, that was, okay. <laughs> yeah. You, you gained a huge appreciation for the horses, the oh. way they can take them and blade them to the side. And they will clear a path like a snowplow. Well, now before that, now the tactics are way more advanced in, in using mounted and in, well, in we, their involvement. We actually trained it. We trained okay. it a lot in, in crowd control for the state fair oh, when impressive. the crowds. Cause, was JT part of that at that time? Um, yeah, he yeah, was. Okay. Yeah, he was. Um, in fact, both sides of it. He was on the SWAT side of that and, and then mounted too. Uh, but yeah, it, it was it was impressive. Um, and, and we'd work hand in hand with them, but it was still one of those things even in, in training and practice you just sit there and you gotta you gotta respect those animals because oh, they're powerful oh good god and, and you, you got to understand that those horses had been through the complete parade route yeah. before responding to the calamity at commerce and griffin and, and boy you talk about horses getting a workout yeah well they they got their ass wore out the one thing they stopped shy of though was putting the dogs on the log leashes they had the dogs hanging out there. I'm like, I don't um, think anyone would mind if you put them on long leashes and let them go. Yeah. But it was it was ugly there for a long time. You, you look at the overall incident, and, and I talked briefly mentioned before, command, control, and communication. Our command staff was knee-deep in alligators, mm-hmm. waist-deep in alligators, and fighting for their own, own safety, if you yeah. will, their own existence. They were in no position to command the overall operation. Control, it was individual squads that provided the control. The senior operators in individual squads provided the control. Communications didn't exist because they couldn't communicate. So those, those fundamental elements of an incident control didn't exist. And, it, and the result is what we see. Wow. Dallas was, Dallas was very lucky that, that Dallas didn't burn that day. Yep. Well, it was it was because of the troops and and, and, and the staff that reacted accordingly mm-hmm. as it unfolded, and mm-hmm. there was a lot of there was a lot of luck that went in that. Mm-hmm. So, this is about evolution. So clearly, from that parade to the following year's parade, it was like night and day, right? Yes. Were you were you were you Absolutely. part of the the the, uh, the the planning for that? I, I was not, but we we all had very brief conversations, mm-hmm. um, very honest conversations about what went wrong and what if we, we, if we ever did it again here's what needs to take place and 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 those suggestions were taken into the negotiations into the planning stage with it and and you you see the result of it thank uh, god the, yeah yeah, yeah. You, you talk about lessons learned well that was one lesson learned and learned well well we're we're going to get into the mob mentality later on, and which uh, they dealt with in the in the early nineties, and that was for that was for something that was supposed to be fun, celebratory, yeah, yeah. celebratory, yeah. and yeah. and we're going to get into another crowd control that's that is not anger it, driven. It's anger driven, and and, and it's uh, directed at uh, police, and uh, you know, Steve Steve mentioned just just briefly about the the mob mentality, yeah, and and its effect on the mob mm-hmm. and, and it and it applies in both situations of course it doesn't take yeah. any agitators to sway an entire right entire group of people you know people are so malleable yeah. they, they will follow Dude, nice word yeah I, I just looked that up <laughs> i was trying to find a synonym danny's whispering uh, words in yeah yeah head. he's yeah <laughs> so i want to get into the evolution of weaponry okay Going from the 60s and 70s, you had shotguns and handguns and uh, revolvers, right? Is that what? Mm-hmm. And going in the late 70s and 80s, you had H and K some machine guns or select fire, select as, fire. as the city yes. wanted to. Was title okay. it. And yeah. initially, initially we were we were provided like 10 MP5s. One of them was an SD silencer on it, and and those weapons served everybody. They were kept in a vault on the equipment truck mm-hmm. and if you got called out and and if the equipment truck made it to the location uh, those those weapons were issued so everybody drew from the same inventory of weapons those weapons were also used in training and so you there's a chance that you might draw the same weapon twice okay okay <laughs> everybody had to say had the same vision uh, so you could see. Yes, of course. You pick up one and wonder why there's Coke in it or something. Dry, <laughs> dried up Coke and syrup in one. Cigarette, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, 
became a need for surgical shots, yeah. right? Yeah. And in close quarter battle, right? When did it need the snipers? When did that come on, come about? Wow, I, I think right after the Texas Tower incident, that precision rifle mm-hmm. would would be integrated, integrated into, into every the, squad. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to talk about a an incident in 2006. An 18 wheeler was involved in that. Do you want to jump in and tell that tell about that incident and what came from that? And also, again, the failure. Yeah. Well, uh, apparently a uh, a suspect who'd been on a, a carjacking spree. Uh, up in North Dallas, Richardson area, all that good stuff was uh, was uh, found a a husband and wife truck team that was getting gas, and decided while the husband's in there paying the bill that he was just going to take the wife and make her. She was a driver too, make her drive and just go on a little fun run with that. So he basically takes her and holds her hostage, gun to her head. You know your your typical hostage thing that you think of when when we train and th- stuff like that. This is this is what you wrap your head around is being able to, to, to work under that environment. Um, he hits, and, and this is the majority of this chase, if you want to call it a chase. It, I think top speed was what twenty five miles. It an wasn't hour that 30. fast, very yeah. much. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because tires have been flattened, uh, so they're they're running slow and they're not running steady. But uh, yeah, it's it's gone on for a couple hours as it makes the big loop six thirty five, then heads down to twenty. Um, great plan was established it was it was a phenomenal plan something that our, our guys had trained on forever and ever uh, it was basically going to be a sniper initiated assault on a, on a moving vehicle so what they had was um, a helicopter is up aerial platform with 50 cal ready to and that what that was to be used for is to smack the engine block break it and, and lock the truck up you had two ambush positions on i can't remember which bridge that was off 20 was it polk I don't remember exactly which one, but there were several because we were at original True. one, and then it kept moving as yeah. because the command wouldn't come down to right. implement it. So, so basically, had all these ambush points, for lack of a better term, set up in order to take this guy out. the The video of it that they took from the news helicopter, like I said, it couldn't be written any better than this. Guy was wearing wearing a white white wife beater T shirt, so which makes a great background when you're talking about a chest shot. Um, yeah, it's it's not any you, you couldn't get any better than that. gun to the hostage's head. Um, it's they basically call a oh, and the other thing you want to have in place too is a react team. As soon as shots are taken, you want to have a team that can can launch on the assault. Um, the the neat thing about that it's very much like this during the the North Hollywood shootout that that LAPD had too. People weren't on duty; it was on the weekend, and they were grabbing kit, catching up to the armored vehicle and jumping on with whatever kit they had. Yeah. So you had guys in gym shorts, you had guys with street clothes with body armor, helmet and a rifle hanging on the, the running boards of this, of this the armored vehicle that we had following this thing, trailing it. So now, I mean, the, the, everything is set up for the perfect hit. Um, and it blows right through the, the ambush point and keeps going. At some point in time, some, some boss up the chain of command had decided that no, this was too politically charged the guy, the suspect was 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 black, and couldn't do it because it, it was too politically charged at the time, and it would be bad for race relations. So when Scott brought up the priority of fire or priority of life, um, the hostage became lowered, and and the suspect became his priority was above everybody else's. And not only that, but civilians, because there's still civilians on the road. They tried to clean out the road, but they were still passing uh, civilians and stuff like that. So basically, they. They compromise the safety of everybody there and put the, the, the shithead's life above everyone else's by not taking that shot. So priority life works with action and inaction. This was definitely a, a case of inaction. So anyway, Matt, I'll let you take over from here, brother. Well, as you said, we were at home, and we started moving that way. And you can hear this chase on the radio, you know, moving. And, it's, and again, you said you could tell it wasn't that, that fast because – you're used to like, well, they're, they're about to hit 20 pretty soon. We kept driving there and kept going there, and we're trying to get there fast. And then it started coming across the radio, hey, this is a big, you know, semi-truck. You know, we're, we don't have a plan right now to stop this thing. Y'all start uh, combining your forces and jumping other, other, other uh, officers' vehicles because the APCs at the time were not there. So instead of having this big, long train of every SWAT guy in his own car, because all of us had cars at the time, nobody had SUVs, start partnering up and jumping in with other cars uh, to try to get more people in there. Um, 
So no, and the, at the time, the 50 cows were stored at the station. They weren't deployed in the field uh, ready to go. And so we knew that. And so the call came out very early that everybody that had a zoo gun, the zoo rifles, a saber. Explain was, that. Okay. Well, we uh, there are 458 and 375 caliber zoo guns that uh, they're distributed through SWAT people that have gone through training and, you know, have qualified with them in case a dangerous animal escapes from the Dow Zoo, which I has have, happened. Okay. Yeah. Get into that. Happened. Dive into that real quick. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, you have, um, <laughs> if you segue. Will, okay. Well, yeah, here's another side story. So when, uh, Jabari, the gorilla escapes its enclosure and the personnel at the zoo that were responsible for containing that, um, failed to do so. The call came out for Dow's, SWAT to respond to that, which they did. Uh, by that time, the gorilla had escaped its enclosure, had bitten what one or two people. I know it bit one lady on the leg. had had done some damage to some people. Obviously, had scared the whole zoo, and people were running for cover. This is this is an animal like there is no man alive is going to be able to do this do anything with this animal it was like king kong like the movie. absolutely yeah. well there no tower to, there, you know like and to hear the people that talk about it he pulled a bench that was bolted lag bolted into concrete right out of the ground and threw it like 30 yards through the air so you're talking about an animal that is what 10 times strong as a man you know it, this it's, it's unbelievable 400 so, pounds i believe yeah, it's it just unbelievable so when this and pissed off it, when this animal escaped and it started wreaking havoc in the zoo you can imagine just people going in every direction and hiding and literally ape shit it, running from I, I, yeah, yes. see there, <laughs> nice. see, that's why Joe's the best. That's yeah. why he's in charge right there. I look for a negotiated. So, uh, <laughs> so when you had the the SWAT response to the zoo, you had guys that did a great job went in there and found it. And you have Tony Black. If anybody that was ever destined to be involved in that incident is Tony Black, who has killed everything the that has hunter. walked on this earth. Uh, he and he has, and he knew exactly what to do. He and Schwartz go up there, and both of them fire at different times, in you know, in putting down the animal. And uh, so that in of itself showed their worth because that animal could have easily killed lots of people. Hang on, they, they were. I think they were using three oh eights. Well, people had shot at it with a three oh eight. Yeah. Tony hit it with a four fifty eight. Okay. Yeah, Tony hit it with a four fifty eight, but. The reason why Tony had to shoot with the 48 because the 308 weren't working, you know. So, and I don't know how many times it was hit. I don't think anybody really knows, but uh, enough, enough. Well, to to stop it, and uh, Tony likes to tell everybody that he's the only person in the last hundred years that's killed a, a gorilla legally. He likes to talk about yeah. that. So, uh, he he tells a much better, colorful story than I could. But anyway, so that was the reason why we have zoo rifles, and they have a need. There's no doubt, and we still have them today. And uh, so it was. Put out on the radio, if you have a zoo rifle, make sure you bring it with you. Well, I had one at the time. and uh, Good segue back. Right, yeah. See, I did that? You're yeah. back on yeah. the 18-wheeler. Off ramp and Go from ape shit yeah. to the 18-wheeler. So, <laughs> but uh, ha- having that, and I'm thinking, man, you know, I've been here for a little over a year. We're about to have this. this obviously, this is a big deal truck chase, and they're calling for somebody with a zoo gun, which I'm pretty close to this thing. And I'm like, if I'm driving, I can't do anything about shooting this thing. So i got to get in the tr- car with somebody to get into a position to try to – help solve some problems so i got into a, i left my car at f- right at 20 and 45 which i was still surprised it was really there there was there was dallas swat crown vicks all up and down 20 for miles going over to fort worth it was funny how we just but that's another story but anyway so we get going and it is hey w- what are our options where do you what, you know and it was just kind of chatter amongst the operators what can we do here because there was no really official command and control put over that incident at that time because it was just really starting and we were getting going and it was like hey can we get a shot on the truck can we slow this thing down obviously we can't see them being in a car much lower to the ground than the truck we're not going to be able to see him but can we stop this thing and it was chatter back and forth back and forth and they're like could you get ahead and put something into the truck to slow it down to start I'm like yeah we can put one round in that uh, radiator really easy there's no doubt we could do that and i could do that very easily uh, anybody with a uh, zoo gun that everybody was trained, everybody knew what they were doing. It wasn't just me. I just happened to be one of the first ones there that could have done it. And the decision was made, or there was decision. The, the decision was made not to do that. And so it just kept going, as Steve just alluded to. It kept going. And then you'd hear on the radio, "Hey, we're going to set up guys with the 50 at this location. We're going to try to do a L shape ambush. Try to set this up. Try to get the truck stop, and then maybe 
get a shot on him if need be because they're having communication back and forth a little bit with him in the in the vehicle on the phone. So it's not like we don't know this is for sure this is going on. We know absolutely the fact he's in there, she's in there, he's got a gun, he's talking all kinds of things on the phone with him. So it kept going. And next thing you knew, you see Arlington, and then you see Fort Worth, and then you start seeing no city. I'm like, where in the hell are we? We were a long ways away from Dallas, and we were getting way out there. And it kept going on, and the talk was going, hey – you know, what are we going to do? What's the plan? Now, the APCs have caught up to us, and you, and what Steve mentioned earlier, you have guys just hanging on the side, driving at 30 miles per hour down the freeway for miles for and miles. a long time. Yeah, you, so you're so far out, you lost your East Texas accent. I don't <laughs> know if I ever could get that far. <laughs> I don't know if I could ever get that far to lose it. But uh, they're just jealous. That's all that is. So. But I can tell you this, is that before we got out of the city in Fort Worth, people were watching this on the news, and they were staked up on the overpasses yelling at this. So it got to the point where it, be tur- it turned into a media thing where people uh, saw OJ. this. And so, yeah, no, free, this, no, free OJ. No, this, it, 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 it was – well, and I don't – whether they were supporting him or us really didn't matter. Yeah. It was there in the way. They just wanted to be a part of They wanted of to something. be part of yeah. that. And so and when you're trying to set up, a position of you know of dominance you know to set this thing up of you know of importance to say hey let's get in a good position where we can set this up to be successful ourselves now you're having to shoo away bystanders or people that are cheering on the whole the whole incident just because they wanted to be involved and so then it was like okay we're gonna let this thing go all the way through fort worth and get out west of there which is a lot less urban and start doing more things you know or you know have the option to do some more things uh, at some point, I don't know when they actually they joined the chase. DPS yes. got yeah. involved, and depends on what you believe. The story that I was told was is that one of them was on duty out in that area, and he called his state trooper buddy who was off duty and says, "I'm about to come right by your house. Get ready. We're going to get into this." <laughs> so I, I don't true. doubt that's probably what yeah. happened. To be honest with you, and if it didn't, the story sounds better than the truth anyway. So we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I was told. But anyway, they showed up in the Crown Vic and. They were just kind of just pushing their way up there, and they were yelling basically verbal at the APC to this team leader who was riding in the front passenger of the APC with the door open, yeah. saying, we, we can help. What can we do? And they're like, nothing. Don't do this. And at the time, one of the lieutenants over one of the units comes on the radio and is telling them, tell DPS we do not need their assistance to back off. And at that time, I see the passenger – trooper who was leaning out the passenger window of the crown vic who he pushed in front of us and just start shooting with his rifle at the ap uh, or at the uh, semi truck on the driver's side on the driver's side because he's <laughs> on the, the passenger side while the driver yeah. is obviously he's driving the car he's leaning out yeah. then you see them slow down come behind the truck behind the 18 wheeler to move around to the now which is the passenger side of the 18 wheeler with the driver hands out with two hands out with his pistol while the passenger who just got done shooting with the rifle <laughs> is now steering the Crown Vic and he's leaning out with his SIG 226. Bubba boy, wanted to get him some. Getting him yeah. some, putting rounds in that in that truck. Yeah. And so we're all, you had the you had the Dallas SWAT team, all of us or half of us out there for, I don't know what the time was, but for extended period of time for miles uh-huh. following this and these two troopers just pull up and just do that. And then of course they hit the radiator and those fail safe coolings in those trucks it started shutting down. Well, they just kind of pulled over to the side and let us kind of do this. Mm-hmm. And to kind of fast forward, when we got done, we looked around. They were gone. They left in the, in the they midst of – They went to go Dairy Queen. They went back. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so the truck starts slowing down. And uh, we were out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we we're near Weatherford. I mean, we we're way out there. And it was like, okay, this thing is going to start stopping. What are we going to do? And so when it came to arrest – we, you see people trying to, you know, trying to get positions. Uh, I was, thought I may have to get out again with the, the zoo gun because it's scoped and maybe have to do something to the trucks. We didn't know for sure whether or not it was really shutting down or, you know, you just don't know. And so uh, we get out of the vehicle and we're there for a few minutes. And then all of a sudden the door, the driver's door opens up and she just basically jumps out. And I did not know this at the time. She had grabbed his gun out of his Ooh. hand and jumps out and th- throws it if you ever go back and look at good video you'll see her pitching that thing out at her way as she's basically and she's not a, a young lady she's an older lady jumping out and she's back that's a good dive she jumps out of that truck to rescue herself essentially and she mm-hmm. pitches that handgun out into the median off of i-20 out there somewhere and 
you know, she saves herself. And then here, then all of a sudden, you know, then it's like, okay, put some gas in there. Uh, I, I think Rose, I think Sergeant Rose, made the call. I don't remember who it was, but it was like, hey, he, she's out. Loaded he's in up. there. Just wear him out in gas. And so the gas started coming into the cab. Uh, and then he, he came out. Uh, and he was taken into custody. And I remember covering off on the cab because we didn't know for sure there was anybody, anybody else in there or not. And he was taken into custody right there. And y'all didn't know that he was unarmed at that point, right? We had no idea. Okay, yeah, I mean, it, if, it, and there up. may have been somebody that saw that yeah. gun, but heck, that could have been her. You, you cannot yeah, take yeah, any chances. No. No and, uh, yeah, you do, yeah and, and again, I remember holding on that truck while they were dealing with him. And I'm thinking, well, this is him. And then somebody comes up later and goes, hey, you know, uh, good job covering. I was like, well, I just thought there could, you just don't know. And it's one of those things like it's better to hold it and just do your thing and let somebody else handle that. So they did a great job when they took him into custody. But we'd followed him from 45 and 20 all the way out to Weatherford. Yeah. And and uh, I don't know if DPS had in the shot. We probably still be chasing that truck. They ran out of gas. Yeah. So it was – you learn really quick that, hey, this thing had a lot of ways it could have gone sideways very easily. And we as a department, other than just being a presence, we didn't do anything to save that lady. She, you know, either, and I don't know exactly how she timed it, whether he gave her the gun or she just took an opportunity time or moment of time, an opportunity to grab it, for whatever. But she jumped out and saved herself. We just took him into custody. So we didn't. We didn't save her. We we fell into the same trap that we do a lot of times in this business where you confuse luck and strategy or hope and strategy and luck and skill. Um, and we've – it just – it kills me how many times we've done that. It's generally going to be because somebody high up makes a decision based on optics or political stuff as opposed to let the people on the ground, let the commanders on the ground run their business because per general orders, they are in charge of that tactical operation. And letting them handle their business, and this was a perfect example of it again. When you get a when you get a person in a leadership and command decision making position that goes on the media and does a live broadcast telling the, the world what we're going to do, and that person is in charge of making competent decisions based on what, you know, based on their imagination, their politics, race, whatever. There's a there's there's a flaw in the system that promotes that. Absolutely. What was learned from that? Well, I tell you, the one thing that we worked on, I don't think we ever came up with a solid answer, was how you assault a, a sleeper truck. Um, we looked at because we were big on pulling shit off, I mean, you know, bars off, off windows, bars and cages off off front porches. Um, we looked at as that as a possibility because basically fiberglass. And so we, we looked at that. We looked at it taking shields up on the hood of the truck and trying to get shots that way. Um, it's one of those things you know you're going to take rounds. You're going to take rounds, and so you, you kind of have to prepare for that. But it was just it basically was you know, try and keep your good L-shape ambush like Matt was talking about or at least stay linear on it, but you have to be able to open up angles on the guy and put rounds on him. Keeping up with the, the uh, timeline of, of weaponry, and I want to go into the incident that happened in 2015 at, at police headquarters. Matt, you want do you want to talk on that on that whole incident and and, and you know, look, 2016 in Dallas, most people know what that story is. 2015, the attack on headquarters it was actually a failed attack. What the, what this guy did, thank God, he he failed in a lot of areas. But would you explain that entire incident as you can remember it and and the finality of it? Sure. Well, the backstory of that is is he was mad about child custody, and he had decided in his mind that he wanted to take out his aggravation on police just in general and the detectives and this kind of thing. So whatever he, his real motivation was, for, I guess for how they believe is his, his, uh, his children and his ex-wife that he thought that the Dallas police department was the reason why he had lost all that. It, it, you know, obviously it was his faults, but he had made that decision. So you have a guy here who has no police experience, no military experience, no tactics, you know, other than, which you could read online or whatever, and he had bought that van on eBay for like less than ten quid. Yeah, it was a, I think a Georgia Sheriff's yeah, Department was, that or some kind that of, had right. that originally. Up armored. Yeah. yeah, it was a van. It was armored, and uh, you know, obviously it looks out of place. But he bought it on eBay. I think like less than ten thousand dollars. I mean, it was you know whatever good deals on eBay. It, it, yeah, clearly he he got a good deal on it, and uh, he had had this for a, a, enough time where he had planned to make this happen and there are certain things 
don't want to let go with some of the things that happened. But he was very, very well versed on how to make the devices that he made. And again, he has no legal tr- or, 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 or uh, professional training in this other than what he learned on the internet. Go ahead. Yeah, and I think uh, ATF, that device got sent to the yes. San Francisco ATF lab. And I think today ATF still says that's the most advanced it is. bomb construction Serious. we've had yes. in America. We yeah. were, yeah. With, specifically with how he designed it to detonate. Yeah, we were fortunate to have a debrief from them afterwards. And they said this was the most involved they've ever seen on American soil. And this guy is not a. You know, former military guy, yeah. or, or you know, mechanically tech. and electric, yep. electric inclined, and t- taking his time and learn and learn online. So anyway, he builds these devices, and his idea is he's going to, uh, in advance, set these devices out in ambush positions. Again, what he tried to do, what he was trying to do, it actually worked to some degree. Uh, what we were lucky about is that no Dallas police officers. We weren't no casualties. That was or any civilians actually for that. We were very fortunate in that. But he had set these outside, and then again it was on a Friday night around midnight. I don't know why he made. It. Maybe he just finally got the nerve to do it. But he had set them out in the parking lot of the, uh, the headquarters to the south side there and out front, and tried to get in the building if I recall. And of course it's locked and he can't get in there. And he's like, well I'm not getting the response I want. So he just started opening up with rifle fire on the front of the building. And of course. There are some people around. Yeah, so he baited the officers. I think he pulled the fire alarm or did something. Did he call something in or I or don't possibly? Yeah, so they, he baited. Right. The, so the officers yeah. came out of headquarters. Right, that's right. You're the right. Security officers. Yeah, I forget. Came out to investigate the yeah, van, I forgot and that. that's when the shooting. Yeah, that's started. when. The, yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. And then, of course, now what happens? Channel One is in a chase with a vehicle that is shooting at them while they're driving, and they're actually trying to stop this because I think they learn pretty quickly. They're switched on. They go, "Hey, that vehicle is different. This is not a." It's not a Honda we're chasing. And so uh, they got into chase with it, and then the call came out for us. Kind of describe well, your armament on there. It was an up-armored. It was up-armored. It was like a, a Ford Econoline van, like a delivery van that had been up-armored. Now, it's not It's not like an APC. And, and but the it, windshield, though, too. Had the windshield the on. Windshield, so yes. any kind of 9 millimeter kind of handgun is not going to go through there. Oh, yeah. So he was Even much five, more. Five, five, six yeah. wasn't going through. And yeah. he had shooting ports on yeah. it as well. Yes. Right, he did. And so I know they had actually re- returned fire with some of the patrol rifle, and, uh, you know, they had hit the vehicle. Obviously, they didn't stop him. And uh, so he would – they got into a chase with him. And, of course, then it's like, hey, this is a rolling barricaded person that's actively shooting at us. We need SWAT here. And so we started coming. Now, this chase is different than the truck chase. He was going at a higher rate of speed. So we're trying to listen to this on a radio. And then we got divided up. Our manpower did. Some people were sent to headquarters. I believe that was your squad that went there. Well, I think one squad got – the called to go to headquarters because we believe there could be more devices more people, or more, more shooters people, there. Right. And I think all of us ended up switching on the radio and hearing the chase and just jumped in the chase. So I think maybe a handful of guys yeah, went Some guys went there, yeah. Did the job they were supposed to. Yeah. The rest of us ended yeah. up yeah, at well, the party. Follow the fun, bro. Yeah. Yeah, so the fun. you can hear that and you're trying to get there and then it's, it's not funny, but you start seeing red lights merging onto the freeway in front of you because you're like, here comes everybody from home. And it's just, it is a caravan of Dallas SWAT heading that way. And you're just like, I will not be beat. I'm going to get there and get involved in this. So we started I think the, they call that getting some. It's getting some. I believe yeah. that's what it was uh, officially called. And uh, we were headed that way. And of course, you're trying to get there and you don't want to blow up the truck because you don't want, you want to make sure you arrive. So we're getting there and you can hear shots are still being fired. You can hear the officers and the angst in their voice. You're like, man, we need to go solve this. And you don't know exactly how many people are in there. Nobody knew at the time it was just him or what kind of motivating factor he's, you know, what was going on. So your mind is kind of running through the whole contingency. Is there another vehicle? Is this guy driving to where he's going to ambush us? Cause that was one thing I was thinking. It was like, this where he's going. That seems odd. Is he driving to where we're going to get pulled in and then, you know, his supporters are coming ambush. after us. Ambush, yes, and things like that. So we started getting down there, and by the time he came to a rest, there was, I don't know how many patrol cars, South Bend 45. There's tons of them. And, of course, I'm driving around them because where they had bailed out was still a pretty good ways away. They had, they, he had exited, and then he kept driving. So those officers were kind of in that – you know, gray area. Do I go back to my car or I keep chasing him on foot because the the vehicle was damaged. And a lot of them chose to stay on foot just to keep eyes on him. So we're driving around them. And uh, one of the sergeants, again, at the time, the 50 cows were still inside the armory at Central and there's no APC. So we're like, hey, we got to go back and get them. Anybody out here with a zoo gun? And so the zoo gun comes back into place again. And I know I was the first one there with a zoo gun that actually deployed and I came up with it. And one of the sergeants there says, 
are you good to go with that? I said, I can do this, what we need to do. And so they're like, if he starts shooting out those ports again, what do you want to do? I said, we can just start at the front and just work our way to the bottom third of it. I'll just start putting rounds through the bottom of that thing. We'll see how armored it is. And uh, if he's in there, we can probably get to him. I said, we can make it, We can make some good shots here. We're less than 100 yards away. We had good cover with the brick, that, that bank that was there that was going to be our cover. I said, I can put some good shots. In that area, it was wide open enough where we knew our backdrop was good. I said, I said we can do this. And, it, and that was one that Tim Houston and I had set up to push up to the part of the vehicle or the, the building to look at that. And he's like, hey, if he pops out, you know, I'll be on him with, with the M4. If he, but if he stays in there, get ready for this, and we can do this. Like, okay, roger that. And we and I had gone up there and, and getting ready to charge it. And about the time, Jude Braun, the only time in his whole career he's actually been early to anything, shows up with the 50 cals in the APCs, and they go, okay, we're going to deploy these. And by far, it's a, it's a superior weapon system, and it's much more accurate in the scope and those guys. So, again, you, you, you know, who doesn't want to shoot, do that with a zoo gun? That would have been fun. But they put the 250s out in, in an L to put on him to do what they needed to do and uh as it progressed they made contact with him the negotiator did and we didn't know it at the time but one of the devices had gone off at headquarters yeah so he had actually called 911 in order and said what he had done in order to get in touch with swat so one of the negotiators is at the command post and he basically says i have bombs at headquarters i have bombs in the van come get me and we we're like, no, we're not going to do that, you know. So Fall pretty, early, pretty, crap. yeah, pretty early on, we kind of knew that the snipers have the game in this one so far. So we're keeping that distance and then trying to own it from all angles and be, and be prepared. Um, but at, Matt's talking about with those fifties deployed. At some point, we won't give everything away, but the vehicle was disabled with uh, the fifty and the three hundred eight. And then uh, at that point, it was just a negotiating game of waiting him out. But once, once the device went off at headquarters that's when reality sunk in yeah and that's when the commands uh the command staff at the command post realized okay this is this is a real deal he he has the means and he has the intent and that we got the green light danny what was it what was the, the environment like so the matt talked about the backdrop which is perfect. yeah so What's the rest uh, yeah this is a great question so he uh, he ended up getting the tires deflated by a stop six when the deputy sheriffs had run them so he come to stop in a parking lot where there is a bank and a jack-in-the-box and some other business. So the freeway is to the rear of the van just, by about you just west of 545. 50 yards to the rear of the van. To the north side the bank and a house. To the south is a like a small road parallel to the service road that leads to a rural neighborhood. And to the front of the van is also like an open pasture field with more residential area. All right, so now obviously these 50s, the penetrating power on these, um, backstop is real important. So the angles at which we're choosing to take up positions uh, definitely has to be accounted for. Yeah. But secondary concern was explosion from the van sure. that right. sent projectiles all over the place? Sure, so it's a guess, it's a guess on – we're taking a guess here on how much does he have in that van, yeah. and so what's that blast radius? Do we, do we start evacuating those people further down on the other side of that pasture and – yeah. yeah, it was. Well, that was one of the questions that uh, Sergeant Rose asked Jude. He says, "Hey, if that thing's full of info or anything like he's he had claimed lots of things, are we within blast radius?" And he's like, "Absolutely. Where we are, we're too close." Oh yeah, we, but we, we had would to, have gotten him. Yeah, we all and he would have taken out all of us or a lot of us. And but we had to be there to for containment. And like I, said, I was to the to the south, we were kind of over on the driver's side of the vehicle. Uh, and our mission where we ended up with was if he get, get mobile again is to ram him to keep him from getting that neighborhood you just talked about. Mm-hmm. And that was our mission. And then mm-hmm. you had the uh, the fifties to the North and back to the Northwest in that L shape to try to get angles. So on what him. views you had windshield view and what was the well, other Well, view? we were at the back of the van. We we're the back quarter of the van on the okay. driver's side. Okay. So he was facing West. So the, 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 yes. the, the, the fifties were to the North, which was to the driver's side. I mean, the passenger side front quarter of the of the grill and okay. then almost not 12 o'clock but a, but well, 12 30 one o'clock was the other 50 okay yeah so basically they're out to the west and to the north looking back i lost you on directions on the vehicle though driver's side the driver's side was to the south he right. was facing so west. Dri- you own driver's side and windshield no back corner back corner okay. back corner yeah, yeah so we're behind it the Sorry. apcs were all more on the rear and those 50s took up the position looking through the front windshield Got it. so that so the apcs could be his driver's stops. side we yeah. had a sniper team because he had when once he had stopped there he had actually gotten out at one time and engaged patrol 
so he the patrol had seen him and exchanged rounds with him. He had stepped out of the driver's door, fired a bunch of rounds, and then gone back in. So we knew there was a chance maybe he'd come out and do the same okay. thing again. So we had a sniper team on that cool. side. And that was really the thought that we had early on, knowing he, knowing he had jumped out of that door. Like, well, that, that, that door works. If he tries to come out, that's what we're going to try yeah. to walk that zoo gun in and either – Get him there or flush him out, and that was when the guys with the M4s would take you. You seem to have an infatuation with the zoo gun. Well, it just happened to be there when I was needed it, oh. but never got to use it. Okay. All right. I'm just prepared, Steve. You are. Thank you. You are. Okay. Carry on. So uh, he starts making the comments to the negotiator on the phone. Hey, I've got, I've, got these, I've got these devices. I've got all this. And then when that thing goes off, it leads to everybody to believe, hey, this guy's got credibility. He knows what he's talking about. And so the idea was, if if he has that, what are our options? Well, then you start talking about what is what what is the collateral? What can he do that thing? That thing's full of explosives. And what he has, which is what you know, and you don't know exactly what he has. You're thinking Timothy McVeigh, right? Is that now. absolutely? Yeah, you're thinking yeah. about uh, Oklahoma City, and so you're like, okay, well, we cannot do this. You can't. It's hard to eva- evac a whole neighborhood at. 3.30 in the morning or whatever. You're trying to get people up. You don't know what's going on. You don't know there's other people involved. So the uh, sniper teams that were out started noticing, looking, zooming in, started to see moving in there and started, after a little bit trying to figure out what he's doing, started figuring out what he was doing and what it looked like he was doing. He had a camera system in there. He, he so did. So he was ah. actually watching the outside. See, so he, had tucked in, he yep. tucked in the back compartment where yep. he wasn't visible as much to the front windshield and he was watching on his camera system. He was kind of the back left of, the, of the vehicle. Smart. And so it just happened to line up where the – the one that shot was the front right, so it just kind of lined him up right through the windshield. And he could see him sitting up, and eventually he realized that the hue or the glow that he was seeing was a cell phone being opened up. And then what he was doing, he was trying to text in to the devices to try to blow up more of them. He'd already done that once. And so when you hear what he says, and then what happens at headquarters goes on after we've already been in contact with him, now you're like, this is legitimate. And so the second or third time he sat up and he dialed him in, he made the shot. Do you mind saying he, who he is? Keith Reed. There you go. Keith Reed did a great job. and uh, Through the windshield? Through the windshield. And then when that shot rang out, you're like, well, that's not a two two three. You know, you knew that was a different rifle. Oh. And, of course, I didn't know exactly who had it. I knew they were there. And you're like, okay, so either you – know, we didn't know exactly he was shooting at him. We just, you know, he knew, you trust him to make his shot, whatever he needed to do, make the do. And he made that shot, and uh, that, that was the only shot that needed to be done. He took care of him with there. Now, he ended up having to do – we ended up shooting more into the vehicle to try to make sure it was disabled because we couldn't see initially into the vehicle. But, uh, you know, you think about the 50s and how there was a pushback from command, never wanting those those weapons here, never wanting that capability. And we had a, a, a commander at one time come in and say, we'll never use those things. Need not have. And uh, because of the resiliency of the guys that, did that and that was jude and sergeant rose and tim and, and all those guys pushing for that for that capability of saying hey we need those things those things are an asset and not taking no for an answer when the time came up and mm-hmm. we had we had a guy who was very well trained in it keith did a great job knew exactly what he needed to do knew what the the legality of it was knew what he could do he dialed Ballistics. right in and made one shot made a perfect made a you know absolute perfect one shot and uh from what I've been told, that was the first time in the history of American policing that a 50 cal has been used against a person, a person, in you know, on a call out. So, I think it still is. Yeah, I think it is. I know they've been anti materials before, but I think it still is. Keith has always been a trendsetter. He has done that. Yes. So, but uh, he, but hey, the credit belongs to him and that whole program that did that, yeah. and they did a great job. And uh, that, that's so when people ask, hey, what. Well, I think because nobody died besides the suspect, it really gets overlooked that incident did. That was a major deal. I mean, that was, I mean, he attacked headquarters. He put out devices. He was a lone wolf in the sense, but he did some damage. And, and luckily, he didn't, he didn't hurt anybody else. But it, that, that thing could have been really bad very easily. No, no, Matt, I think you're correct in saying that because he was a lone wolf and because he pretty much failed. He failed at everything. Even at the time that he went into headquarters, there was like, I don't think anybody was really at the front desk at the time, right? At it was all locked that, up, yeah. Yeah, so he, he really, and if he had came up, uh, during the part of uh, the morning or the uh, the afternoon, he would it would have been a lot worse. Sure. Well, again, you don't know is, is he would did he have the the confidence to try to do it? Then you know who knows what he, he's thinking. Yeah, he, he wouldn't have. Yeah, there are more guns and more right. bodies there. But he but uh, but what came about from that incident as far as security for 
headquarters has has definitely changed as well as the substation. Took a while, but that was kind of getting still taking a while. It is still yeah. yeah. You, there's a lot of half construction done, but that that event kind of kicked us off to tr- at least making our our division uh, substations and headquarters a lot more secure. Mm-hmm. Still in the works, but it took that tragedy and took that incident right. uh, to to spur that right. Yep. Which the good thing is you see a lot of departments around the country that see this. And then they make change. They make adaptations to their buildings and train their officers for that kind of stuff and equip them. And, and that's the way you're supposed to do it right. in this business. Learn. Yeah. Learn from it. Uh, from other people. Sure. Instead of having to make your own mistakes. Um, do we do we have a few minutes? Because I'd like to hear the input on the planning and the management and command and control of the right two years ago. What? How did the command work? How, how did that crowd control situation um how was it managed how oh, did boy. it how did it evolve man i'll let you lead off because you're an asl so you can kind of talk more about he's gonna bring here. up a zoo gun again you started <laughs> out <there>. <laughs> <laughs> damn it no okay. zoo gun on this one <laughs> yeah. uh well again coming in that day we it was discussed that there was going to be a, a anticipated protest that night i along with pretty much everybody else had no idea to what what's to a read. protest about well, it, it was about the uh, killing of George Floyd up in Minnesota. So which it, it was one week after yeah. the death of George Floyd. Right. And again, you know, obviously with media and the news, everybody knows of everything now. So that yeah. was, you know, and we have been doing protests for the last several years now. It is, I don't want to say it's nothing new, but it is, it's not rare for somebody to come and say, hey, we're going to have a protest tonight. Yeah. And everybody just knows that. Yeah. And you adjust and you shift whatever. So we came in that day, it gone through the regular day. And then it's like, okay, we're going to protest tonight. We're going to need people to be on standby. They did at the time did not know to what degree, you know, the level of the response was going to be needed. So they went to the meetings and it was like, okay, we're going to put out a overwatch to, to, you know, and some of the, I'll let Danny talk about this, to some to different positions to try to monitor the crowd and see what was going on. But we were all, I said, we, the rest of the SWAT, we were going to be staged up by headquarters, um, staged up by headquarters to, you know, be available to respond if needed. And at the time, we didn't know what was going to be needed. Well, I think they said that they were just going to assemble at headquarters and make a statement. Right. And they had asked them if they were going to march, and I think they was indicating probably not is what they were saying. Now, I know by the size and, and what they had done in the past that there was a good chance they would go on a march. Who knows what mm-hmm. route they would take or if they had a planned one. But I don't know if our department had a plan for if they were to march. I never heard anything about a march. It was supposed to be a localized protest, like you said, at HQ, at, you know, the headquarters where that was going to be, and your assets were set up to handle that. And had it had just started there and ended there, no matter, even to, if it had gone really bad, we were all allocated for that. And so your resources were pooled there, and so we could respond. When they got mobile, and whenever that actually, would, the decision was made by them to do that, now they may have made the decision to do that but long before they got there, but when they made the decision to go mobile, it was we were kind of caught flat-footed. We didn't know exactly where they were going and didn't didn't have a response. And so it was like, okay, are they only going around the corner, going to disperse, or are they going to continue? And when they when they crossed over thirty and got into downtown, and the masses of people that were just on. coming in, and I don't think anybody could anticipate, you know, suburbans fooling up and eight people jumping out in that truck driving off. People were Ubering into these things downtown, and it was I, nothing like I had ever seen. And you talk to people that were here in the Cowboys parade and they saw that melee, which I'll talk about earlier. They're like, this is that times whatever. It just yeah. amount of mass of people. And when we got called into downtown, downtown was full. So real people. quick, what it, what it transpired around the country up to that point? Well, there was protest, you know, a lot of different places. Obviously Minnesota was just, you mm-hmm. know, engu- yeah. and they were just Minnesota's engulfed in flames. Yeah. yeah. But they, they had set fire to the police headquarters. Okay. They had shot at officers. They'd already started that, zone if you will yeah. whatever you want to call chop, it chop zone. yeah the chop zone. Yeah. 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 that's yeah. what indicates to me that there's a good chance these people are, are going to march or right. riot here yeah and i i think as a department there wasn't that contingency or even that thought process possibly yeah, yeah. well to that level it never been happening here before but yeah. and, and, and i and it's i think well i think just law enforcement in general across the country got caught off guard because yeah. these protests yeah. erupted and mm-hmm. every major city had this huge you know problems and uh so that thing kicks off, and by the time it was a little after 9 o'clock, when they said, hey, we need SWAT here, we need to come in, and here comes Keith Reed again. We go in, and 
He's everywhere. He, he is. Keith is everywhere. And we pulled up to the uh, – because we had driven in there on our, in our own vehicles, and the APCs were brought in later because it was like, okay, this thing's going south very soon. Mm-hmm. And right there off of uh, Griffith Street, uh, that's where we all kind of centered where the whole trouble was really originating from. And they were getting peppered. Now here comes the bricks. Here comes frozen water bottles. And here comes stuff that's coming in. Officers are getting injured. And you're like, well, how can you fight back on stuff that's being hurled 50 feet away from behind a crowd? You don't know who's doing it. And so, and to those officers' credit, the ones that have been uh, mobilized for mobile food force, they were trying to stay in the line or hold the line, I should say. But what do you do when you're just absolutely overrun with a thousand people over 20 officers? Nobody can do it. I don't care no. how equipped you are. No. I, was in, I was in the helicopter the first night. So I got to see this all evolve and the mass amount of people. So it started off with that assembly at headquarters. Then it kind of went and started marching into downtown. And like Matt says, you just see like ants just start accumulating. And it was incredible to see the different pockets or cells of groups, four or 500 all over downtown. And you just see the destruction of the businesses, fires being started, shots fired over here. And essentially you have officers running every direction, just trying to put out fires figuratively and literally. literally. Um, but there was no, no plan at wow. that first night. Yeah. Wow. Well, and you, and you, when you you have citizens that are needing help and they are just totally enveloped by the crowd and you don't know who's good or who's bad. Yeah. And you have people that were there that were legitimately just wanting to protest and that's fine. And we all support that, but let's be honest. They were in the minority. The the vast majority of people there were trying to cause trouble. Or even if they didn't go there to do that, they quickly jumped on that bandwagon. And you had officers who were ill-equipped to go in there and try to save these people or help these people, and they were getting in trouble and getting enveloped by the crowd. And so now you have officers and citizens begging for help. And you're like, okay, we got to go in and start solving problems. And that's where the armor comes into play. Without the APCs, it does not happen. And we, it saved the city from burning. There's no families. question about it. There was families driving in town who did not know what to expect and were all wow. confused and trying to get to their hotel, and they had little kids, and yeah. I'm grabbing them out of cars and trying to run them in. This is two, the two blocks from the Omni. Did you guys go to gas or anything like that? Well, we did. Uh, it, it was Help hurt? Oh, no, it Oh, it, it definitely helped. worked. Good. You yeah. know, and uh, the the aerial bangs that you know the, putting them in to help disperse the crowd. But you had to get a foothold. And so once we brought the APCs in, and Keith was the first one in there with us, and we got on his APC, and it was like, okay, button this thing up, push that crowd up, come out of the turret, start putting out you know uh, chemical agents, Hand you know cre- yeah, handhelds just to dispense them, and just try to build that bubble around you so you can get that foothold. Then we can start making operations from there. And that's really how we did. We took it one block at a time. We took over mm-hmm. that block and mm-hmm. we solved it. And I'm gonna tell you this: uh, retired Lieutenant Mark Vernon, absolutely excellent job. He did. He's a stud. He, 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 you could stud. not have asked for a better guy to handle that. His Marine background and understanding big awesome. picture and understanding awesome. assets yeah. and all yeah. that. And for four days, he basically was in control of everything that needed to be done. That and the, the guy did a great – I mean, you cannot say enough about what he did. And, to, and I'll give – you know, and a lot of the you know, people above him said, hey, this guy knows what he's doing. Let's stay out of the way. Yeah. He, he was the tactical commander. Of the he way. was, yes. He was so the, yep. this is the time where they actually followed the general orders and that he was in charge of the operation. He did well, I don't deal. know if they followed general orders. Yeah. I think it was desperation. Well, yeah. I think also I think it I think, was, we don't know what to do, but yeah. you do. So. Yes, yeah. Yeah. absolute necessity. That, that's exactly yeah. what it was. No, because they're like this guy knows what he's doing, and they respond to him. Let him do it, and that's his, and that's what they needed to do. And here's here's a sad thing: so many times, and and not only SWAT scenarios, but actually patrol too. Well, you'll get a couple individuals that'll just stand up and take charge, and make sure. Uh, you know, you got your you got your formal and your informal leadership. Sometimes that informal leadership is what saves the day. Oh, so it, going further with this, so the second night there was twenty thousand people here. The second night was worse. The second night was by far worse. Um, it was just the wild west, and you had the SWAT guys splitting up into like teams of three or four, right. and basically grabbing a bunch of these mobile field force patrol guys, these sergeants and these police officers, mm-hmm. and helping push certain mm-hmm. groups of five, six hundred people. And then we'd hear shots on the radio somewhere else, and we need help. And so guys would break off yeah. and go with that contingency. Like firemen. It was yeah, yeah. It was crazy. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever yeah. been through in my life. Wow. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we shot every piece of gas or chemical agent or riot, you know, munition we had, all of it in the first two days. That's a lot. And they had to do an emergency it, order. Explain munition. Okay, well, you have you have handheld, you know, gas and, mm-hmm. and chemical agents and stuff that works for riots. 
that some of them you can put outside, some of them you cannot put on the in, inside. And you had, we used all that handheld. And then you had your 40 millimeter grenadiers up there shooting um, gas and shooting aerial banks and shooting sponge rounds, which are, you know, to, you know, to, stri- to strike, yep. you know, uh, people who are doing bad things. And one of the big things they would do is they would go up and put a cone over the chemical agents that were dispensing gas and pour water down it to help put it out. Yeah. Smart. Yeah, and, 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 and where do they learn this? They learned it from watching you know, oh. the internet and everything from else. And so oh, yeah. they were, and they, they were hurling water bottles. And in the second night, they were much more prepared for us. They had masks on. We had guys with gas masks on. They had face shields on. Because this is this COVID just started a few months ago. Shields. And they, they had face shields on. They I was, I was watching cars come off the freeway like five or six deep in them, and they'd get out, pop the trunk put on these masks and backpacks and these Antifa shirts and then go run into yep. the crowd, just pouring in. And we grabbed a bunch of people, uh, out of state license plates. The furthest one I got was, I got a guy from Hawaii <laughs> and just made up a story like, Oh, I was just coming to see Dallas and see what it's yeah. like. Oh, yeah. Grassy yeah. Knoll. Uh, I'm yeah. Yeah. A big tour. Fan. Just a yeah. tour. Yeah. And I will say this out of all the major cities that had the writing, Dallas was the only one that did not have a loss of life. That's true. And I will say yeah. that I looked at it, what everyone else was doing in the cities on how the response to us and Dallas did it differently. I won't say what it is, but there was something I think we all kind of agreed on and the approach we were going to take with these crowds and mm-hmm. that kept our officers safe and it kept us from being put in positions where we had to take lethal force yeah. on some of these Good. people. Yeah. Did you guys spread the word on that, the intel on that to oh, other departments? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Really people have asked. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thing about, about teams today is if, if there's something that works, we're, we've got more of a system for – pushing that out to other teams so they, they they can learn from it. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Yeah, it was just unbelievable, you know, just to see the mass of people coming in, you know, and just the amount of people that were yeah. just trying to fight back on every little thing. Right. Anybody, any of your guys get hurt? Yeah, we had guys get hurt. You know, we, uh, you know, nothing significant. We had an officer, uh, one that was on Saturday downtown right by uh, City Hall. He got hit in the eye, right by the eye. Right. That was one of the first ones we had to go in there and evac him. Uh, that kind of what started everything on on Saturday was that was that particular. I, I fractured my foot the second second night. Well, I saw that happen. Yeah, yeah. So I was we with you on we, that we put I think Matt and I put like eighteen twenty miles on our feet in full oh, gear man. in yeah. about ten or twelve yeah. hours, and we yeah. end up chasing a yeah. guy who shot mm-hmm. at a woman holding her child, mm-hmm. yeah. chased him down, and then at the very end, I kind of yeah, it was just yeah. too much abuse on the foot. Yeah, cool. No. Yeah, I saw that. I, well, when your watch tells you that you're going to die because you're walking too much, you know, <laughs> all the steps that you did. <laughs> That's funny. Fun. It, it was. Yeah. Mine it was, told me like that walking in here today. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Was, I went and downloaded that, you know, and you saw that. And I think we did 28,000 steps in that one, that second day. Yeah, I, I, I talked to Danny. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, and, it, yeah. and you talked about it earlier, sir, about the physical fitness. You know, yeah. it, this was May, you know, and yeah. it was it was hot, it's humid, mm-hmm. you're in kit, you're wearing helmet and all that, and you're fighting them. You know, when I say fighting them, yeah. you're oh, doing wow. all this for you know, like almost 17. We went on home for like three and a half hours. This is not yeah. just – this is all a SWAT. Yeah. There, was, there was a lot of officers, let me tell you. We had help from Irving. We had help from Garland. We had DPS right. in here. So I'm not saying this is just Dallas SWAT, but I know for us – you know, we did like 13 or 14 days in a row, but like, you know, three or four hours late, then came right back and did that second day, which is even longer. So your physical fitness and having the yes, confidence sir. in yourself and your people to be able to go do that, you cannot stress that enough. We, in, in the beginning, we had to fight tooth and nail just to get permission to do any kind of a workout. And it was because we don't want you working out on city time because everybody else will want to work out on city time, you know. I mean, it, it was a fight all the way, and how you can't do without it. You you can't do without it. Well, it was interesting to hear Danny say that was the craziest thing he's ever been a part of, and, and Danny was very had a very intimate encounter on seven seven twenty sixteen up in that in that college. Mm. Um, yes, he did. We're not going to get into too much of that. Everybody knows the story and knows the horrors that that uh, that occurred. I do want to ask. Uh, Steve and, and and the commander, from from the outside looking in, of seeing this going on in the city that you served for so long, what were y'all thinking when y'all were watching this unfold on the news? I was in disbelief that it was happening. The other thing is, it, it's having my son doing what he's doing, getting involved in that. Uh, I was greatly concerned. Not so much that it was a lone wolf, that it may have been 
a coordinated event, which would le would lead to much more um, drastic consequences. Um, but I really, I kind of wish I could have could have in some way contributed to make make things a little less damaged. But that's that's just you know a, a mindset. But uh, yeah, I. I agree. I mean, my first inclination was the shit finally came to our doorstep. Mm -hmm. You know, that here's your five percent that's going to do some damage, and he's he's after cops. He's ambushing cops, and and I'm I'm with Scott. I think the natural inclination when you're a former action guy, don't say it, don't, mm -hmm. don't yeah. say it. Yeah. yeah, don't say it. Former action guy <laughs> is you you want to be there, and and not because you're you're seeking the glory, you're seeking the adrenaline. It's just you you want to be a part of it to help your brothers out. Right to uh, that. Yeah, and that that's that was my natural inclination. Yeah, Tom Popkins said the same thing, yeah. that he's sitting there watching from Colorado and seeing this unfold, heartbroken. Yeah. That yeah. the city he served yep. is mm -hmm. under attack. Yeah. And, and also, the um, you know, we talked about Baton Rouge happened three days later, you know, yeah. that, that yeah. attack. And, yeah. and it really, everybody was scared shitless. This is going to be, that this A is trend. the new normal, yeah. right? Yeah. And we are under attack, and what are we going to do about it? And it's happening other places. You get ambushed officers all the time. Yes. So it's, it's yeah. basically, and, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, but it, they went through this in the 60s and, and yeah. late 60s, early 70s too, where, where there was an open season on cops. And and I think when your public is against you and defunding the police and, the, and, the, and that it's going to apply or appeal to a certain sect that are going to take matters in their own hands. And I look at them like they're rabid dogs. You, and whatever you do with a rabid dog, you handle it the same way with these guys. Um, it just, and and I keep going back to if they're if they are this huge a danger to cops, what are they to general society? The the ones that can't defend themselves. So um, yeah, the mindset's got to change. It, the mindset's always been there for the police. It, it's they've always had that mindset. It kind of goes dormant every now and again because we get we get lackadaisical. But the mindset's always been there. I think that the troops, you guys did a phenomenal job on that. I think um, the the solution was genius. I did ask one question to I can't remember who it was. Was it Jeremy? Who built the charge? Jeremy. Yeah, it was Jeremy. I asked him a question. I go because they used for a tamper. They used to tore the cover off a book. Yeah. And I is that right? Yeah. So the, the it question. was just attached to the book, so the robot had something to grab okay. onto. Yeah, yeah. So you must have asked the same question I did. Yeah. What was the title of the book? Yes, and yeah. he didn't know. Damn it! And I was like. Best yeah. piece of trivia we yeah. could have there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But genius solution. Genius solution. Um, mm -hmm. I can't think of a better fitting ending th than that. The pictures are phenomenal. You know, it tells us a good story, especially when you look at the potential collateral damage if you guys would have gone in there firing. Um, you know, press the, press the problem. Uh, I just It was a genius solution. And no, all good. I don't think we had a zoo gun on that one either, did we, Matt? No. No zoo gun? Damn it. When <laughs> I want to get into and finish with the evolution of equipment. What do you think? Let me tell you where we were when I left. We were still carrying the heavy body armor. Some of it was in warranty. Some of it was out of warranty. If it was out of warranty, they made you put your light body armor underneath it. No, that was actually longer before that. That was that was embarrassing. But uh, didn't have the rifle plates. Uh, we had decent. We had the M4s with with either most guys carried EOTechs on them. Mm -hmm. Some carried aim points on them. Um, helmets were still military issue. We didn't have the fancy stuff you guys have now. And obviously we didn't have the BDUs you guys have. Ours were, you know, half of them were, we used to wear black ones. Remember those? And of course, it, it was so obvious yeah. from the salt stains from the sweat that, that showed up more on the black than it does the blue. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we've we've made some changes. Or you guys made some changes. Where are you at now? I say this, but it, it, the city still pretty much just provides a SWAT team, a helmet, a vest, and a rifle. Okay. And I think they stopped giving us rifles now. We yes. have to go out and get them. <laughs> so what, what every, rifles are you guys carrying? Every, everything everything else that it's usually through federal funds or private funds. But right now we're carrying the um, LWRC uh, M6, nice. the piston gun. Matt can talk a lot about that because that was kind of his project. Yeah. What about what about optics on those? Uh, we have a choice between the EOTech and the Aimpoint. Okay. I mean, guys can pretty much use whatever they want. That's not a a, a rigorous, uh, a regulated item. Okay. Well, I would just if you look back when I came over and when Steve was still there, you had not everybody had red dots. Not everybody had even a flat top 
carbine. You had some people still carrying an A2 carry handle. You had incandescent lights. Uh, not everybody even had a light on their pistol. Now you couldn't give a SWAT guy a, guy, a pistol without a light on it. You know, now a lot of us, Daniel and I, we have red dots on the guns. We have on the, on the pistols. We yeah. have, you know, aim points on that. And so to see the evolution where we have five APCs when they're all running, you have everybody having a top-of-the-line, you know, carbine that's suppressed with, you know, the, the night vision capabilities that we have with the mall and to be able to do that and to have, you know, the explosive breaching capabilities on the vehicles with the guys. Yeah. You know, the uh, ballistic breaching, the snipers are now all suppressed. Uh, to be able to show up with just a handful of guys and to rapidly deploy on an HR, which if you think about on Abrams, how you know, we did that, yeah. uh, that it is not centric driven anymore by command. The, the operators can push out into the field, get there, the four or five of them, and they can either set up in a position or play, build a charge or place a charge or have something ready to go in case they have to go. Yeah. And that is all done on the operator level, uh, and every squad has that capabilities. And to, to see where that is now compared to where it was when I first came over is not even close. And it is night and day. And that's a, that's a huge advantage for us. And guys get stuck on the equipment, of course. I mean, we got guys who are, who are what we call gear queers. But really the gear and the advancement and the equipment really facilitates the advancement of these specialties or the tactics. You know, So this equipment is enabling us to further these tactics. You still have to have software over hardware. Yeah, right? I mean, Matt just got mentioning earlier offline about um, stealth of contact on a HR or hostage rescue using the, the night vision or the knots and going in and doing all this without shots fired because we can extract that hostage and then pin that guy in and find his location and then resolve this situation. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the equipment has really enabled us to take programs and the specialties and just everything at the operator level further. Well, you guys yeah. run IR pointers off those then? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the mall has it both. Yeah. IR pointers, nice. yeah. yeah. And, and it, another point, like we have two Ford 350s that are the backs outfitted with the large box, and that's yeah. for a breacher to have all the saws, extra explosives, the torches, breaching tools, and rather than wait for the equipment truck that used to have that to get there to the hostage rescue, as soon as those guys get out to call out, they can start going to work with that stuff. That's just your master breachers have those, right? Right. Yeah. 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 One on each unit. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you know, and not only having the the, the equipment and having the capabilities, but you've got to know how to use it. And so, you know, over time, being able to implement that and to recognize when we didn't have it, the deficiencies. Hey, if we'd have had this, man, how much mm-hmm. better that could have been. Mm-hmm. Time's critical. You, it's you a, see it's that, a, yeah. And you, so find. you look at those. You talk about the different incidents that we went through today, and every one of those led to something to be developed or to push for because of that. And they're not going to give it to you. You got to go out and fight for it. You know, we have yeah. a lot of agencies that come in the train. They go, "How did y'all get that?" And you're like, by not taking no for an answer. You just have to keep pushing and keep pushing mm-hmm. and keep fighting for that. And then when you get it the impetus is on you to go train with it and to become proficient with it because just having it is not going to solve your problems. You've got to yeah. be really good with it. And that's where the night vision has really come up where, I mean, think about that, trying to do that all those years ago. Like you never would have even thought about that. He's like, would you have the confidence, even if they gave it to you, to do it? You wouldn't. And so it's from all those hours and all those reps inside the shoot house or the Sims house doing that. So when they do call and you got to go in there and save some little girl because this dude is holding her hostage, you can go in there and save that kid and get him back to the mom you know, because you have that confidence, you know, and that's where it all comes from. So the vision of this episode was to show the history of SWAT from the 60s up until what we have now, here we're in 2022, to the evolution of weaponry, tactics, equipment. I hope that we captured that. I, I don't think we could have got four of the greater minds that have seen these different eras. Well, Steve, you're, I had a, you, you're a backup. The I first sure, per, my sure first choice <laughs> <laughs> to get the commander here, uh, I've been told is, a, is, is quite the feat. I've had several people texting me saying, you can't believe uh, he actually showed up. And I, I can't thank you enough for being here. You're actually going to be, uh, I'm going to talk about it later. You're actually going to be part of a, of a, uh, another episode. And we'll talk about that later. You, you, you'll be okay. You'll be all right. Matt, your expertise, you're always welcome on the show. Uh, it's I can't thank you enough for being here. Steve, your reputation walks in before you do. 
I don't know what that means. No. Is that like an odor? No, no. Oh. And it lingers it, after it he does. leaves. Yeah, we're gonna have to. We're gonna get the hazmat team to clean this nice. room up after <laughs> you leave out. That, but that chair you're in, you've been in there for yeah. two out three hours. We're gonna have to just throw that in it, trash. It's all this talk. Yeah, just it, macho talk. Yeah, it is macho talk. Well, there's gonna be a lot of people punching their steering wheel, pissed off listening yeah. to this. But remember, you're talking about the Jack Parrot being the prick in the academy. Right. Scott was a prick on the team. He was in charge. He was he was the man. We called him the commander. He actually competed for one of the years too. Um, but he demanded excellence. He demanded excellence. He demanded everybody be professional. Because of that, he trained us hard. Oh God, I, I just every time he would we'd finish run and gun, and you know before work or after work, and we'd do all the all the events, and then he'd break out the clipboard. We're like, son of a bitch, because we're going to run, run the old course. And sometimes we'd run it twice. I remember one time we ran it three times, and it just I mean at the end of training in the heat of the summer. But he demanded excellence. And, you know, and, and we, we all would bitch about it. And he'd just look at us and go, this is what a SWAT team's supposed to be like. You're supposed to work hard for one mission as a team. It was just that mentality of, of we expect more out of ourselves because the community expects more of out of us. So, uh, And that's kind of the end point to talking about the equipment. You guys have great shit, but some, one thing has not changed throughout the years, and that's the warrior. The that's warrior's the all the same. It's the heart. the heart. Yep. And and that's one thing that I'm glad to say is is consistent. You guys have proven yourself time and time again. Like I, I would hope to think that we did too in our day. Um, but uh, it's be proud. Be proud. Time goes fast, boys. It goes fast. And blink of an eye, you're old like me and Scott. I just threw myself under the same bus. You'll you'll look back and say, Well, I wish I'd have wrote a book. Yeah. I wish I'd have kept notes. Uh, no, because they'd probably end up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> or an insane asylum. That's, that, that's <laughs> possibility. Guys, I can't thank y'all enough for this. It's, uh, I think this story it, it, this story is going to resonate with a lot of people. I guarantee there's going to be a lot of SWAT teams from around the country listening. I have the uh, North Carolina SWAT shout out. They they messaged me about this episode already. They can't wait to hear it. I hope we do it justice. And y'all service to the city and commander and steve the foundation y'all laid long ago matt and danny have picked up and they are now teaching the next generation of dallas swat and i think swat in great hands with people like y'all passing the torch y'all still got a lot of work to go y'all aren't done yet but i am proud to be on dallas police department and i'm proud to know people like you in dallas swat Thank you all for your service. Thank you for doing this for me. Thanks, Drew. He's a good guy.